Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand? Last week, I celebrated Easter with my mother and my brothers and their family. My mother had been away for three months, and she came back on Monday, Thursday. And as I said Monday, Thursday, my sister-in-law, Loretta, said, why do they call it Monday, Thursday? What is the meaning? And I said, well, it's the new commandment that Jesus gave us, which we read in John chapter 13, verse 34. And my nephew Robert said, you mean all the new commandments that the Vatican has sent to us about global warming and uh, you know, social injustice? And I said, no, no, it doesn't refer to that. First of all, in the time of Jesus, there was no ecological pollution and there was no social just injustice because there were not multinational corporations at that time. It was a command that Jesus gave us. And Jesus said, a new command I give to you. And my brother said, well, if Jesus gave it to us 2,000 years ago, how can you call it new? And I said to myself, ay caramba, what are these people thinking about? And I said, it is new because Jesus called it, and since you haven't heard about it, it's new even till today. Don't you think so? But I could understand the frustration of Jesus in our gospel today when he said to Nicodemus, are you a teacher of Israel? And you cannot understand these things. Now, in fairness to Nicodemus, Jesus was speaking about the Spirit, and he was explaining the gifts of the Spirit. Now, they had heard about the Spirit, because right from the, book of the, Pente the books of the Pentateuch, we hear about the Spirit of the Lord at the beginning of creation. But the gifts of the Spirit that you and I know about, wisdom and understanding and fear of God and courage, those were the things that we're hearing for the first time. And therefore, Nicodemus would say, what are these things? Now, so often we are taught things, and the, the speaker will say, have you all understand? And we'll all shake our heads. I do very often, even though I haven't understand, uh, understood it, because I don't want to appear stupid or foolish. But Nicodemus was willing to risk it. He was willing to go for the truth. He was willing to be humiliated. He was willing to hear from Jesus, are you a teacher of Israel and you cannot understand these things? Jesus was speaking about the Spirit and he spoke about, we do not know where it comes from, we do not know where it goes, but the Spirit leaves gifts behind for each one of us, you and me. And as I said, it's the Spirit, those gifts we receive at baptism, more especially at confirmation and during this month of April and May, we will have the bishops going around confirming so many candidates, the gifts of wisdom and understanding, the gifts of knowledge, and especially the gift of courage. The gift of courage that we see in our first reading today, when the people, the early church, sold everything and held all things in common so that nobody in that community was in need. What a beautiful way for any church to exist, wouldn't it be? There was unity, there was charity. Which came first? It's like the chicken and the egg. Actually, they both came at the same time, you may say so. They were a small group of people, the early church, 20, 30, 40 people of them. They knew one another so they could love one another. There were some that were educated and some that could not even read and write. There were some that were rich, some that were poor. And therefore, they held everything in common. That was the great challenge. There was a unity among them, and the barriers that you and I, I have today were not there. Today, we speak about those people who have got PhDs, and we don't have any. Those people who have got a lot of money, and we don't have any. Those people who are rich, and people who have got class and culture, and we who don't have it. All these things seem to come in the way, but they did not come in the way then because they were willing to be joined together in the name of Jesus Christ. Very recently in our papers, we hear about the troubles in Kenya where ethnic groups are killing one another. And then the Olympics are coming up, and they're willing to put those ethnic strifes behind and come across because the people from Kenya have dominated the marathons 
from, from Ethiopia and Kenya, from the great Abebe Bikila until today. They dominate the scene and they're willing to put that aside for the sake of a glory and a crown that will pass. In the early church, it was in the name of Jesus Christ. So how do we hold things in common when we are one billion people? Even in a small church, in a parish like St. Basil's or the parish that I work in, 300, 400 families, how do we care for people that are in need? How do we hold a common purse? It is very often done through the St. Vincent de Paul Society, and yet we know they only touch the tip of the iceberg. But it is still a challenge for us to live simply, to hold things in common for the rest, and to break the barriers that keep uh, dividing us and keep us from unity and charity. Recently, we saw a picture in one of the local papers with a flock of Can Canadian geese flying over. And I remember the story of a bag lady. She looked up into the heavens when she saw this, and she said with a beautiful smile on her face, God really spoils me. And people looked at her and were wondering whether she was a little off in her head, but she wasn't. Whether she was mocking, and she wasn't. She was genuinely happy to look at this marvel of creation and wonder at how God could spoil her. And I thought to myself, she's wearing rags. Her next breakfast or dinner will come from the garbage pail from an uneaten hamburger, perhaps. She'll go to the public washrooms to wash her face, to go to the washroom. How can she look at this and say, God is spoiling me? If we tend to live simply, or we do not have our hearts tied down to earthly things, we can have that peace and the joy of that lady. She looked up into heaven, and that moment she was taken from the drabness of her everyday life and transported with a peace and joy, which, you know what? All our federal finance ministers and our local finance ministers, all the money they have in the treasury will never get us that. But if we pick up the challenge of the Acts of the Apostles, where they held everything in common, where they took care of those in need, then we will enjoy this peace and this joy that this bag lady had and that we envy. And with all our iPods and computers and all our latest fads of electronic goods, we can never achieve. May God bless you all as we try to live out these beautiful tenets of the Acts of the Apostles. They sold everything, they held everything in common, so that those who were in need were taken care of. And people were added to their, to their numbers in great numbers. 3,000, 5,000, we hear that in the Acts of the Apostles. We don't need those numbers today, we already have them. All we have to do is to live out that same simplicity and joy of the apostolic times. That is our challenge today. God bless you all. Let us now pray together. For the church called to transformation and renewal, we pray to the Lord. Lord For the building of peace, justice, and compassion, especially in troubled spots of the world like Zimbabwe, Kenya, and other troubled spots, we pray to the Lord. For all of you who have asked for prayers, those who give thanks to God for this televised Mass, for those suffering from Parkinson and cancer, for those facing imminent death and for their caregivers, for those who struggle with pain and with broken hearts, we pray to the Lord. Lord For our eighth grade students who during these months will be confirmed and may they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in all its abundance, we pray to the Lord. Lord Gracious God, you have given us Jesus to be our Savior. He witnessed to the love that you have for us. Help us to carry on his mission of being witnesses of this unity and charity throughout the world, through Christ our Lord. Amen.